Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the course of quantum transport. Uh, let me first tell you a bit, uh, although it's not in my slides, uh, about the course, um, about um, assessment, about um, some organizational details. So there is a course in uh, quantum transport. It's about how electrons traverse nanostructures, about all quantum mechanical effects, which can be arranged there, including uh, Josephson junctions, qubits, quantum dots. Uh, we will go through a variety of uh, phenomena. It doesn't make much sense describe them all now, uh, but I guess you know that you're prepared. So the course will consist of uh, 12 lectures given online. Uh, they're pretty usual. In addition, there will be homework. Homework is not checked is not delivered it just you know for your orientation whether you do it or not uh, well nobody would check uh, in addition to these lectures i will also run for problem solving sessions so i give a certain package of homework them in several weeks I kind of uh, speak up and uh, explain uh, how to solve this homework. That's a usual road of the course. Um, perhaps next year it will be renovated, but well, we don't talk about next year. Right. Uh, for me, it is a special course because it's basically about uh, events of my life. When I was in your age, when I was a student, all this field just did not exist. I entered to this field from um, my early ages and still stand there. So basically, uh, most uh, most topics we we discuss uh, have been um, fields of my research. Nowadays, uh, science has uh, developed uh, the more interest, to, for instance, in qubits than quantum transport. Nevertheless, I think it's uh, still interesting and valuable course. Uh, just to know. It is neither theoretical nor experimental. And let me explain this. Um, remember your course of electromagnetism. And there you've discussed electric field, magnetic field, but you did not learn how to wind coils from copper wires and how to make uh, capacitors from uh, waxed paper, right? So um, as there are many important technicalities about electromagnetism, but they're not usually taught because uh, what is taught are concepts, electric field, magnetic field. There are many important technicalities about nanotechnology, about quantum technologies. But I uh, hardly talk about this. So I will discuss some experiments in uh, detail. Um, it's not about uh, experimental nanophysics. It's about concepts of nanoscience, concepts of quantum transport. Good. I hope you can live with this. So let me uh, start with 
current lecture. I would repeat that I prefer questions to the chat, and I prefer as many questions as you can meet. Uh, it gives me necessary feedback. Um, otherwise, to be frank, I feel um, a little bit alone uh, in Zoom. I have an impression that I talk to myself in my computer. Uh, hi, Floris. Nice to see you. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, so, but uh, okay, videos is also nice, but I do prefer questions. So you would react to, to what I talk. Uh, yes, uh, is the book necessary or can we survive without book? Yes, sure, you can survive without book. There is indeed book available, I forgot to mention this. Uh, but, well, uh, first of all, uh, this course only a, a portion of this book, perhaps a bit uh, short. If you're really interested in quantum transport, if you uh, really want to make it your research field, I would recommend to buy the book. Uh, otherwise, there are lecture slides. There are also lecture notes, which are pretty old. Uh, you can find it as a bright space. They're not supported anymore, but there's some story about slides on the lectures. So I guess you can survive. Uh, fine, uh, then uh, let us um, start the course. And first of all, I'd like to talk about electrons as quantum waves. An important message that will be that will be scattered as waves, and that actually defines quantum transport. I guess it's the most important lecture in the whole course. So if you just um, go through this lecture and don't attend anything else, you would get a good half of the message. Right, uh, I will switch a bit the jurors several times. So first of all, we basically repeat quantum mechanics, uh, electrons as plane waves, as fermions, uh, we'll talk about potential barriers and waveguides. Uh, then we will turn to nanostructures. And I will try to prove you that these waveguides and potential barriers, which are pretty abstract, could actually describe um, complex and nanostructure structure with many de design details by virtue of scattering matrix. So we come to scattering matrix, we will understand how to compute average current. Um, uh, in terms of scattering matrix. Then there will be a little bit, yeah, advanced material. Usually people don't know dare to tell students about this, but I love the subject person. I think it's quite accessible. That will be about counting electrons, about electrons which propagate uh, through the structure and you don't measure average count, you measure also fluctuations of the flow. Uh, right. Uh, in the end, there will be a short uh, blurb about uh, what we will use um, later about distribution of transmission coefficients in uh, different nanostructures. Very good. There's a problem. Uh, no. There's, uh, there was an outline. Uh, what I put here are chapters in the book, which are covered here, as you see. It's not all chapters which are covered, but uh, it's pretty dense for the first lecture. Very good. If there's no questions, uh, let's um, go for that. Right. Electron is any quantum particle if put in vacuum without any obstacles, without any potential. Um, it fancies to be in a state with a certain momentum or which is the same with a certain 
wave vector. So it becomes a plane wave. Look here. Plane wave is a wave function. The plane wave is an imaginary number of the same modulus, right? If you recall that the square root of wave function is probability, we will understand that electron is actually spread over well, the whole universe, the whole sample, the whole box where we keep it. That's why here I have the strange square root, square root of normalization volume. Right, so to get to get full probability to be anywhere, I need to integrate this uh, probability over the whole space. I should get one. That's why this is normalization to make sure that the particle is anywhere, that the wave function is properly normalized. Right. So there's plenty of plane waves, and they differ in wave vector. Here it is. Wave vector is wavelength, it's kind of distance between wave runs. There are periodic wave runs, and electron propagates in the direction perpendicular to the runs. All uh, right, here just plot imaginary and um, real part of the plane wave sinusoidals. What else uh, we know from quantum mechanics that wave vector and momentum are related by Planck constant. If we know um, momentum, we can compute energy p squared or 2m. So here we are. So we have uh, actually infinitely many uh, states uh, which differ by k, where electron can be in a vacuum, in a big volume. Good. I expect that it's not new for you that you took to quantum mechanics in some form. Usually it um, doesn't raise questions. If you have questions, please, uh, please uh, shoot. Right. So we have empty states. We can put some electrons inside. And electrons as uh, written is uh, our fermions. And according to this, according to feminine statistics, you could not put two electrons in the same state. So it's either zero or one. All right. What we need for further going is a number of states in a small cube of three-dimensional K space. Small cube, delta KX, delta KY, uh, where's the sort axis, delta KZ. Right. I would not uh, tell how to, uh, how to count the states, uh, it uh, would be uh, to my taste a bit childish. It uh, sh should be explained in, in the quantum mechanics course. I just give you the answer, which is very logical. Look, this is uh, volume in K space. This is volume in actual space, normalization volume. Um, well, 2 pi is always come with a k. And there is a strange factor, 
two with index s. What do you think? Where does it come from? Just to let you recall what we know about elections. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you, Timo. It is uh, the shoes. There are two spin directions per each election, so uh, there's a doubling of number of states. Good. And let me introduce uh, something which we will use heavily in the course. Let me introduce feeling vector. So we take uh, this and uh, there's something with my camera. Strange. Looks my camera is gone. Oh yeah. Uh, and um, uh, the feeling factor, which is a function of K, is a fraction of field states in this cube. So feeling factor can go from zero, no states field, to one, all states field. Fine. If you know this feeling vector, we know everything about uh, this big ensemble of electrons. Uh, we could compute density, energy density, current density of electrons. Okay, how we do this? Well, we just sum over the states. Huh? This is number of states. I divide it by volume. Uh, right, this is feeling factor, fraction of feeling, uh, field states. And if you compute density, you just take all states with factor one. If you compute energy density, you multiply it with energy. If you compute current, well, each state, each uh, state has a velocity associated with K multiply by charge, so I got current flow, right. It's important to know, uh, to note, and sometimes it's kind of um, a rather surprising for students, uh, at least it was surpri uh, surprising for me <laughs> in my age, that quantum mechanics, uh, okay, it's a wonderful science, uh, has um, um, many powers, but quantum mechanics alone just cannot set this feeling factor. Actually, the states with any feeling factor are pretty legal quantum mechanical states. Right, and what eventually sets feeling factor is another science, is statistics. So if you take electrons in the volume, set it to some state with certain uh, FK, it will stay forever. But if the same ensemble is uh, put in thermodynamic equilibrium, with some bars, so the inter interaction with other ensembles of electrons, whichever, um, then according to statistics, feeling factor is set to pretty much defined uh, value, which depends on energy. So there is an index F, this is a Fermi distribution of uh, electrons. So what, what does it mean? The distribution depends on two letters, letter mu, chemical potential, and letter T, temperature. If temperature is zero, um, all states are filled up to chemical potential. And then all states are empty at a little bit higher energy. 
if temperature is finite, this jump is not sharp. Rather, there's some crossover smooth by temperature. Let's perhaps uh, think of uh, real situation, real numbers. If we take uh, uh, electrons in uh, metals, oh, pretty usual metals. Uh, what would be your idea of chemical potential in electron volts? Huh? Ever took the solid state physics? 10 electron volts. All right. Yes, 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 yes. It's a good number. So how I remember this, I remember that uh, electric batteries work eventually on the difference of chemical potentials. Batteries provide several volts of uh, voltage. Right, so the total chemical potential must be uh, must be uh, um, uh, of the order of uh, um, more than one electron volt. Uh, yes, I know the question. Uh, while temperature, uh, say room temperature, is something like ten to the minus four of this value. So if it looks uh, at real metals, thermal broadening is really very small in comparison with chemical potential. Even if a metal is about to melt, it is still very small. Right, the question, uh, what is on the horizontal axis of this graph? It don't really get what the graph is showing. Uh, uh, all right, so first there are two graphs. Here I plot energy as function of K, the parabolic dependence energy of on, on K. Uh, right, and I mark chemical potential in energy, so all states here are filled at zero temperature. Right, here in the uh, next graph, I plot um, filling factor versus energy, but just, just did it in a less formal uh, manner. Feeling factor is on horizontal axis and energy is on vertical axis, all right? So feeling factor is, is uh, one at negative energies, uh, smaller than chemical potential and goes to zero at higher energies. All right, Yanis. Good. Uh, let's go get uh, further. So now we know how to deal with uh, kind of solids with um, um, metals, and we shall talk about the metals because uh, we need electrons conducting. We need at least metal leads. Um, uh, which are connected to nanostructure. Let us talk about waveguide. Here's a magical side of uh, quantum mechanics comes in all the uh, glory. There are tales, uh, there are kind of literature about um, words of different dimension, right? About flatland, or not, I, I, I don't think anybody wrote a uh, literature about, uh, about uh, one dimensions, but it, it could be. And quantum mechanics actually allows us to modify dimension of our world which is next impossible, but uh, quantum mechanics provides you this magic trick. Let us see how does it go. 
we will take a waveguide, which is a box which is uh, elongated in x direction and is restricted in y and z directions. Okay. And uh, let us figure out um, what would be a wave in this box. I could uh, talk about, uh, I will uh, talk about electron wave, but almost the same applies to uh, electromagnetic wave, for instance. It's property of waves rather than particles. All right, we could go uh, pretty much in mathematical details uh, for this simple geometry. And in this geometry, the wave function can be separated, can be presented as a product of wave functions in Z, X, and, and Y. Right. And for X direction, it is just plane wave. I don't know this because uh, uh, motion in x direction is completely unrestricted. But in y and z direction, of course, it can electron cannot propagate it hits the walls. The function must be zero at the walls. Right. So eventually I have a problem of standing wave. So in y direction, I have a number of standing waves. What does it mean? It means that a uh, wave vector in y direction can only take quantized values. All right. What are these quantized values? Uh, that is uh, clear from standing wave picture. Uh, these uh, values are quantized as, well, it's a number, and I divide it by uh, H, and there's a factor of pi. Good, so there is an infinite set of uh, discretized uh, I values. The same we can say about Z direction. And uh, what does it mean? It means that in this wave guide, I have one dimensional particles which come in many sorts. These sorts are distinguished by two numbers. Right, so I plotted energies for different sets of numbers. Uh, you see there's a offset of these energies. How do I know it? It's a kinetic energy of the motion in y and z direction. So I just substitute quantized values of k, put it in kinetic energy, that's what I get. All right. So by virtue of quantization, we don't have three-dimensional particles anymore. We have many sorts of one dimensional particles, that's it. Uh, okay, nobody calls it different sorts of particles. People in waveguides, uh, in um, a transport theory, prefer to call it modes, propagating modes, or which is the same, transport channels. 
kind of incoming electron can take one of the channels and propagate through waveguide as a one dimensional path. Fine. Any questions? Sure, that's a bit, uh, it's simple matrix. It uh, looks like uh, what uh, people show in, 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 in the third case, but still it's magic. It's um, quantum mechanical manifestations of uh, particle dynamics. Very good. Uh, let us uh, go further. Let us talk, uh, let us complicate the situation a bit. All right. Uh, and I will check about the um, scattering now. I will talk about scattering at the, at the potential barrier. So I will assume that they have one dimensional particle. And uh, in addition to that, there is a potential barrier of height u. I guess uh, it's a definition of good quantum mechanical book that this problem is treated in the book. So who can recall this problem from your quantum mechanical book. I kind of assume you had any. Hmm? Nobody, okay, here's a quick call this. And if you don't, yeah, such a recall this. If you don't recall, don't 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 worry. It's there. Just take this book again and and find this edition. So, as far as uh, the book with the cat is concerned, it's there. Perhaps you just forgotten, or your teachers forgot to tell you. But let me uh, let me shortly describe how does it go, how to solve this problem uh, with the potential barrier. All right, we are look, we, we, we're looking at certain energy. And uh, on the left and on the right of the barrier, um, there is a wave vector associated with energy. But as you see from this equation, it has two solutions, plus and minus k. What does it mean? that there are waves propagating in two opposite directions, two solutions. And we have to match these solutions in a certain way, right? I uh, would assume that on the right, there's only um, outgoing waves. Nothing com comes to the barrier from the right. Good. That sets it. There's some coefficient which I don't know yet. T, transmission amplitude. Uh, on the left, what do I have? I have incoming wave, I can set amplitude to one, and there's also reflected wave. Good, uh, that's nice to know, but uh, we don't know yet these amplitudes, how to compute them uh, by matching. Uh, in the barrier, there are also two solutions with a different wave vector. Why it is different? Because energy is different, because there's potential energy uh, applied. Fine. So um, these coefficients are also known. We have four unknown variables. Good. We need four equations. And those are equations of matching. At each boundary, we match values of wave functions on the left and on the right, and the derivatives of the wave function 
with respect to X. So each uh, boundary uh, gives us uh, two equations, combining them together, we get four equations to compute this um, for, for amplitudes. But what we really want to know, um, I don't think what happens in the bear is interesting. We want to know what, ha what happens uh, outside. Transmission amplitude and reflection amplitude. Uh, good, let me discuss the answer. This is transmission coefficient, transmission probability for rectangular barrier. As you see, it's model squared of transmission amplitude and that goes um, in line with whole quantum mechanics. Amplitudes like wave function probability is model squared of wave function. So anytime we go, we, we, we are about probabilities, we square amplitude. Probability of scattering. And uh, let me first discuss uh, the answer for classical mechanics. <coughs> and that's very simple. If energy of the particle is uh, below, the very high, it, it just doesn't go. And if it's higher, well, it just goes through. Right. The curves in between are quantum mechanical calculation for different uh, vistas of the barrier. Right. The first thing to look at remarkable quantum mechanical effect, it's tunneling. So despite the fact that classically electron cannot jam the barrier, it can channel through, right? That gives rise to some small probability to go through. Well, if uh, the barrier is thin and can intuitively uh, figure out, that uh, tunneling is easier. Uh, if it's thicker, it um, is uh, smaller. Right, that's I see here. What do I see here? First of all, transmission coefficient uh, doesn't quite match um, uh, uh, one. It means that electrons are reflected from the barrier, feeling Feeling the kind of uh, feeling it. Right. Oh, I also see kind of strange oscillations as a function of energy. Who dares to make a hypothesis about origin of these oscillations? Francesca Bertz, yes, very good. Um, electron kind of can reflect from the bearing two points here and here. And there is interference between the reflections uh, from here and from here, which explains this uh, oscillation uh, pattern. Uh, could be a rather complex question. Let me ask a simpler question. I've been talking about thin and thick barrier, but uh, you know, thin and thick uh, um, in physics uh, do not make much sense. Uh, in physics, we always compare two things, and only them you can say that something is small or big, right? So, uh, thin or thick barrier, is it in comparison with what? Uh, perfect session with respect to the wavelengths. There's some wavelengths, and presumably there's a wavelengths in the barrier. And uh, depending on this, uh, the barrier is either thick or thin. 
So for senior barriers, if uh, the barriers are the order of um, uh, wavelengths, one expects more quantum effects. Uh, very good. Let me just uh, turn to my main business. Let's see. I'm doing with respect to time. Uh, I guess we will have a, a break in uh, two minutes. I have some line is not very applicable, but um, I still prefer to have uh, a break. Um, and let me turn to nanostructures. Uh, without going into details and showing concrete nanostructures, let me just tell that nanostructures can be very complex. I just sketched one. There are two leads. Uh, here on the left and on the right, there are gates which actually form the nanostructure. There are impurities which you don't want them to be, but they are because of uh, technological limitations. Uh, much of design goes there. But whatever complexity, my statement, uh, which uh, sounds a little bit uh, simplistic, uh, that in any case, the nanostructure can be modeled as a wave guide with a certain number of transport channels. Yeah? Remember these modes. Uh, and potential bearing. And what is essential in transport problems, all these details, all this design solutions and technological problems, all of them go to a set of transmission coefficients. And the set of transmission coefficients is enough to describe the transport through the nanostructure. Uh, that's because perhaps too big of a message. You might just uh, trust me because I'm a teacher, but uh, frankly, it's uh, rather unconscious. I could cheat you. So I will try to give you a kind of a proof. And for this, we will consider it by steps. We will look at a diabetic quantum transport. Uh, and quantum point contract. Uh, but I think we better make a break. Uh, let's have um, eight minutes break. And I will um, stop the recording. So we have uh, this task to prove correspondence between uh, complex nanostructures and wave guides is potential berry. So let's uh, go for that. He does want to go. Here we are, diabetic quantum transport. So let me take wave guide and let me deform it. Let me change the, uh, the, the opening. So that it was ideal wave guide. Now I change its width and I gonna make a constriction in this wave guide. Let me recall kinetic energy of restricted motion that depended on the transport channel and on the width of the constriction. And I see that in this case, this energy depends on X, so it becomes potential energy. And if uh, if uh, wave guide becomes more narrow, it gives more potential energy. 
So in fact, this constriction can be seen as energy barrier. Strangely enough, but it follows from this formula rather naturally, the height of this barrier is different for different transport modes. Uh, for bigger N, this potential barrier is bigger. So what I did, I have plotted in this figure, this potential barrier for different channels. And I choose some energy, energy corresponding to chemical potential of electrons. And what I see that plenty of channels have eventually reflected from the constriction. Those are closed channels. And if I uh, assume that the transport is adiabatic and it doesn't give rise to any reflection, well, the barrier is classical and all transmission coefficients are zero. As far as open channels are concerned, and you see there are only three of them. In any case, it's finite number of transport channels below a given energy. For these channels, transmission is one. So in the construction, I have a possibility, actually, if I have a control about the width of the construction, I can change uh, the number of open channels. Fine. Let us uh, get from wave propagation to electron transport. Let me put this constriction into electric circuit with two conducting leads or reservoirs, whatever you call it. Another word is terminal uh, or contact lead. It really corresponds to two massive leads I connect the nanostructures to. But we look at the waveguide, we look at the opening, and what do we see here? The rock closed channels coming from the left, yellow color, or from the right, green color. They are reflected. What does it mean? It means that they do not contribute to the current through the nanostructure, right? I would uh, look at the current at a certain cross section. The number of particles going here is precisely the number of particles going in opposite direction. The current is zero for closed channels. For um, open channels, it is the same, but a little bit different. If you uh, look at these two waves, which are propagated, uh, propagating in different directions, uh, the current will be zero if both states are empty or both states are occupied. But there can be a situation when uh, electrons going from the left are present, but there are no electrons going in opposite direction. So there will be current. The current can only be in open channels. All right, I guess for this situation I have. Bad graph, let me replot it. So here plot. Filling vectors on the left and on the right. And I see that the current 
is proportional to the difference of feeling factors on the right and on the left, right? So if uh, feeling factors are steps, I would only see current in this narrow energy strip. What is the width of this energy strip? It is given through difference of chemical potentials. But this is precisely the voltage difference I apply to the leads. So here you have the voltage. Right. Let me now concentrate on the current. <clears throat> I have to take electron velocities and I have to take density of states of these electrons. And it turns out that these two factors compensate each other precisely. So the current in this situation does not depend on velocity of electrons. Right. So what I have to do in this case, I have to um, integrate over energies. There can be transmission of any energy. I have to take difference of uh, feeling factors. And uh, right, I now can integrate this. Integration just gives me the width of this energy strip, that's it. So what I have a car for current is proportional to number of open channels, some coefficients coming, uh, and there's a risk, uh, this of the energy strip, which is nothing but voltage. So what we have after all is a linear relation between voltage and current. Uh, so the coefficient in this relation is conductance. And we find that the conductance is quantized. Quantized because number of open channels is quantized. And there's universal coefficient, which is called conductance quantum. And we will see this quantity in very many places in our course, uh, which consists of elementary, <coughs> sorry, elementary constants uh, only. And it equals E squared divided by pi B H bar. <coughs> Sorry. Good. Conductance quantum. It is uh, like uh, 25 inverse uh, kilo ohm. Rather low conductance, rather high resistance, but it's not, not enormously, enormously high. Uh, yes, Sasha, you're right. Uh, uh, we don't consider tunneling at this moment. So uh, just to simplify, to give an uh, ideal picture, we will take into account tunneling undoubtedly, uh, but uh, first uh, we consider this uh, uh, ideal case, which is called quantum point contact or quantum point contact. All transmission coefficients are, are either zero or one. Uh, good, let me, uh, make next step. And that already brings us pretty close to experimental uh, reality. There was actual experiment made and uh, I'm always proud of the fact that it has been made in Delft of all places. Right, let me talk about experimental details. Uh, first of all, they made two-dimensional electron gas. They have layered uh, uh, semiconductor nanostructure in a certain way. So at the top of this um, 
chip, they have formed two-dimensional electron gas. It's kind of side view, right? And this is top view. Uh, on the top, they put metallic electrodes and apply voltage to this electrodes. And uh, the voltage uh, repelled electrons underneath. So what you see in this picture, white are two-dimensional electrons. And uh, gray, the places where electrons are repelled by leads. Good, what does it mean? It means by changing voltage at these gate electrodes, one can reshape the constriction. One can make this uh, conducting channel more, uh, uh, one can open and close it, it one can modify it. It's right, and the measure conductance, very simple, um, very simple um, um, uh, quantity to measure. Look what they got. So horizontal axis is gate voltage, and basically this is the width of the constriction. It gets uh, wider to this direction. Uh, and the conductance appear to be perfectly, uh, well, I wouldn't say perfectly, noticeably quantized. You really see a sequence of steps and each step corresponds to one more open channel added to the structure. This is somehow striking because there are zillions conducting channels which try to come to the structure. But only a certain number, which depends on voltage, one, two, three, four, actually pass and take part in quantum transport. Good. Uh, let me look at the chart. Uh, uh, right, question of Baron. Does it have to be a smooth opening or could it be also two rectangles nearly touching each other? Uh, one have a difficulty to compose um, ideal transmission with rectangles. We have seen it shortly for example of rectangular barrier the uh, um, electrons are reflected from sharp pictures of potential. So anytime the potential jumps, it gives rise to certain reflection uh, probability. So potential uh, is better to be smooth. Uh, right, uh, yeah, and uh, that we required to make simplified picture to um, have um, transmission coefficients uh, either um, zero or one. Um, and if you see at the experiment, the quantization is not ideal. There are some crossovers between steps. And here, one of the channels apparently has transmission coefficient between zero and one. So it tunnels through the respondent barrier. Um, that was a question from uh, Yanis. Uh, let's see, uh, open channel. Let's look here. So there's constriction. Uh, which works as potential energy for electrons. This potential energy is different for different channels transport modes. And if uh, one looks at certain energy, it's energy of chemical potential basically, uh, one sees that some, for some channels, 
uh, in this case with n uh, 0, 1, 2, this potential barrier is lower than the energy. So these channels are open. They are allowed to go through constriction. But most channels which are there just cannot come through this narrow opening. They have to be reflected. So this is a difference between open channels and closed channels. And as you see from experiment, it's a pretty practical concept. You can actually uh, count how many open channels or approximately open channels are there in structure. But again, quantization is not ideal. So that I have to take into account transmission and reflection. Uh, in these channels. Uh, but if I do this, I kind of, uh, in business, I can describe oh, uh, tran uh, quantum transport, uh, including realistic structures. So what are the steps? A diabetic quantum transport, we still have finite number of channels, but only a few of them actually go through constriction. Okay, one can change these walls, we can open it going to quantum point contact. Here just infinitely many channels come into constriction, but only few have a chance to transmit. Right? Uh, for very smooth potential, it's ideal, it's either zero or or uh, one, uh, for realistic situations, there's still, still some tunneling. So all the channels kind of can tunnel, but transmission coefficients are very small and can be neglected. So in fact, transmission coefficients are big only for few channels. Uh, right? So we can introduce reflection scattering. This scattering can be due to impurities. It all can be incorporated into transmission and reflection coefficient. And thereby we can describe real life. Good, I have finished my proof. Believe me or not. Oh, okay, I could present uh, lots of mathematical details, but uh, I don't think it's necessary, I guess intuitive picture is pretty, pretty clear. Scattering. Let me go a little bit mathematical, and this is necessary because uh, I'm describing an approach which is very general. Um, I pretend it to be valid for Raymond and structure. So I want to get as general description as possible. So let me introduce scattering matrix. Good, I have two leads. And I have, well, in principle, different number of channels, propagating channels in on the left and on the right. Uh, I have incoming amplitudes to the nanostructure to this uh, black box. How many of them? NR plus NL. And I have outgoing waves. And I set a matrix which relates one vector to another vector. Uh, one vector is a vector of incoming amplitudes, a complex vector with this dimension. And another vector is vector of outgoing amplitudes. That's the definition of scattering matrix. Since I have two leads, I can separate this matrix in two blocks. Four blocks I have. What is this uh, first block? It is for particles which come from the left, and are reflected to the left. This is for reflection from to the right. And those are transmissions uh, from the uh, right to the left, from the left to the right. 
Good, there's still matrices and because there are many channels, there's still blocks in the matrix. So this is a scattering matrix. Uh, let's look at uh, its properties. Let's look at its properties and most important property, which is a bit difficult to comprehend or recall from linear algebra um, is that this matrix is unitary. In mathematical uh, sense, it means that uh, conjug emission conjugated matrix times matrix itself is one. This property accurately reflects very simple concept. Very simple concept that the particles uh, are conserved. They are not coming from nanostructure, not originated at nanostructure nor they are absorbed at the nanostructure. So all particles which come, go out, right? In terms of probabilities, what would it mean? Uh, reflection coefficient plus transmission coefficient must be zero. This is for probabilities. But quantum mechanics is not about probabilities, it's about amplitudes. So from the fact that these probabilities have to be satisfied for any situation, for any uh, incoming amplitudes, unitarity must hold. Good, if I uh, rewrite this unitarity just in terms of blocks, well, I have a uh, square of reflection blocks, square of transmission block, um, that amounts to one in total, very much resembling this relation. Fine. That is most general property of scattering matrix. Uh, there's also um, rather general property which holds when the situation is time reversible. And in practical circumstances, practical experimental circumstances, usually it means that magnetic field uh, applied to uh, your sample um, is more or less zero, can be neglected. Time reversibility. So in this case, uh, transmission from the left to the right is equal to transmission to the, from the right to the left. Why is it so? Um, let's uh, shoot a movie of a particle going from the left to the right. And let's uh, rewind this movie and um, watch it in opposite direction. You will see a particle going in opposite direction and amplitudes will be precisely the same. Uh, fine. Uh, now I want to give elementary example of a scattering matrix. Um, so I want to make the dimension as small as possible. Right? So I consider one channel scatterer. So there's only one channel from the left and from the right, but there are two waves. Two incoming, two outgoing waves. Right? So I deal with a matrix two by two. It's matrix two by two, two reflection amplitudes, two transmission amplitudes, the squares are the same. So there is a single transmission coefficient for the scatter, but it's not all. There are also two independent phases. They don't affect the transmission. Later, we will look at the interference. We will see how phases come into play in, in quantum. Let us see the questions. Uh, yes, the, trans, uh, Sasha, uh, the transmissions uh, are exactly equal from the left to the right. There is no conjugation. Uh, and this unitary matrix is generally, well, we just exposed to too many Hemitian matrices. So you would naively expect something like that. Unitary matrix is not emission, it's 
it is uh, unitary. In fact, it's exponent of Hermitian matrix. Any unitary matrix can be presented as a uh, exponent, imaginary unit, Hermitian matrix. Fine, uh, I, uh, Francesca doesn't understand how the magnetic field is related to time reversibility. Let us first understand that magnetic field changes sign if time goes on. Again, let us make a movie. So there are electrons going through a lead, creating um, uh, some current, and that current creates magnetic field. Let's shoot the movie in opposite direction. Current goes like this, and magnetic field will have to change sign. So magnetic field changes sign upon time reversibility. Good. Then if uh, you have magnetic field in the picture, time reversibility is broken. Uh, potentials, potential energy, potential scattering does not change if uh, time is reversed. That's why uh, just with potentials, uh, the situation is uh, time reversible. Uh, let you see, there's a question. Good. Um, all right, two dimensional matrix with limitations imposed by unitarity. It's ele uh, elementary and elementary example of uh, one channel scatter. Let's see how I'm doing about time. Mm, all right, that is uh, affordable. We still have like 23 minutes. Let me talk about Landauer formula. Landauer was a rather unusual scientist. It was a person, right? It was a scientist who lived in the United States. But in distinction from most uh, American scientists, he was not assigned to university. He has been working in industry. Uh, it was called IBM, International Business Mas Machine Corporation. Uh, but well, he has been doing physics, but uh, since uh, he was industrial scientist, colleagues did not really regard him with all respect he deserved. And frankly, they uh, thought he's a bit crazy. But anyway, he has derived the formula, which is very simple to explain. And it is uh, very difficult to explain why for like 20 years, people did not believe him. So that part I won't explain. I will explain easy part. Landauer formula. It's a statement about the current in our nanostructure, which is described by transmission coefficients. And this transmission, this um, uh, structure is uh, characterized by scattering matrix, and I only care about propagation part. Reflecting electrons don't contribute to the transport. And uh, this part, this block has a set of eigenvalues. At each energy, there's a set of transmission coefficients corresponding to the number of channels. Right. And the current reads, let us see, we have seen almost all elements of it for quantum point contact. There's conductance quantum coming. So may, uh, integration over energy summation over channels, difference of filling factors from the left and from the right. The only modification is this transmission coefficient. 
this transmission coefficient enters expression to star. Okay, if we uh, look at low uh, voltages, we can disregard energy dependence of transmission coefficient, and then we can integrate the formula, and it gives you linear relation between current and voltage. That's it. So this is conductance, conductance quantum plus the sum of all transmission coefficients over all channels. Landauer formula. Let me present a simple minded derivation of Landauer formula, which is almost like in a point contact. Um, let me compute how many electrons in an energy strip, which is set by voltage, how many electrons in this energy strip come to nanostructure, right? That's how many uh, do. We again see the width of the voltage, uh, the width of the energy strip. We see time, uh, proportional to time. Eh? Uh, and we see a collection of uh, fundamental constants. Two also comes because uh, electrons come with, uh, with different spin. Right. And all these electrons are given a chance to pass through the stoner structure. So the total charge passed is a number of attempts. ATT stands for attempts times the chance divided by time, we get the average ton, uh, tunnel. That was for one channel. All channels um, contribute to the current independently. That's what we get. Sum over channels. This is simple-minded derivation of our formula. Again, as uh, I mentioned, it is very simple. And it is difficult to explain uh, why people didn't believe him. Perhaps when we go to lecture three and uh, talk how people thought about transport uh, before Landauer, it will become a little bit more clear. Uh, fine. Let me finish this piece uh, by... Um, talking about restrictions and limitations of scattering approach of Landauer uh, theory. Um, I didn't say it explicitly, but we assumed elect elastic scattering. Uh, so electrons, each electron, comes at certain energy and, and uh, it leaves in a structure at the same energy. Elastic scattering, no energy loss. This energy loss can happen due to interaction of these electrons. Interaction of electrons with themselves, interaction of electrons with photons, phonons, whatever excitations they can find in a solid state on a certain substrate. So eventually we also disregarded the interaction, which is almost the same as to say that scattering is elastic, no energy loss in cause of scattering. Right, and that's it. We, uh, if this is uh, fulfilled, Landauer formula scattering approach works. Let me now discuss when does it work under which circumstances. Uh, it can show that uh, nature uh, is generally merciful for us. And with very, very simple concepts, we can reach pretty accurate description of this world. At least a description which we can uh, utilize and get good living from. Right? A uh, particular example of this is that electrons 
do not interact if the energies are closer to family surface, right? So there is a, a strip of energy, uh, energy strip where electrons do not interact. Good question is why they do not interact. Uh, who knows the answer? In principle, you could have heard it in uh, solid state physics. Uh, and I uh, would even presume you have heard it, but uh, sometimes people don't want to confuse students uh, about this. Okay. Correct answer is that the electrons do not interact close to Fermi level because they are not electrons, but rather quasi electrons. Actual electrons are charged particles, they interact according to Coulomb law, there's a tremendous repulsion. But they are put into metals, they interact with other electrons, they um, interact with lattice. So in fact, from free electrons, they become quasi-electrons. Charged excitations at the background of, uh, of field electron level. Those are called quasi-particles, quasi-electrons. So if we would really use correct terminology, I would uh, have to say quasi, 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 any time I mention the, uh, an electron. But well, uh, who cares, right? It's better to skip this, um, this uh, um, quasi, and it's better to call these excitations electrons, given the fact that they are also wave particles, that they have some mass, and that they uh, have same electric charge as the electrons. Good, uh, let me finish this piece. Um, a low temperature voltage means that the energies are close to Fermi level. So it's a good for applicability of uh, scattering uh, approach, applicability of Landauer formalism. Short structures are also good. Why is it so? Uh, if structure is short, electron traverses the structure pretty fast, which means that it doesn't have time to have energy loss. Right? But of course, to put these limitations on numbers, that pretty much depends on the concrete non-structure and the quantity of uh, interest. Um, eventually all non-structures go to limit of uh, scattering. But for instance, uh, if you have Coulomb-located non-structures, that happens at uh, very low temperatures. We will talk a bit about this. Uh, fine. Any questions about this blog? Because um, I'm going to start to teach you counting. No questions so far. We studied the Landauer formula. We understand how current conductance is related to transmission coefficients. Uh, yes, Sasha, you're right. We do consider the voltage difference to be somehow small compared to the energy. Uh, in principle, um, um, within approach itself, that doesn't have to be so. Uh, one could just introduce transmission coefficients, for instance, uh, if, uh, yeah, energy dependent transmission coefficient and incorporate even bigger voltage differences into there. But it would uh, make it rather impractical because for such um, a big voltage differences, of course, electrons do interact, 
they come into a structure with enormous energy. They will excite lots of excitations. So they will collide with them. So it will be um, weak and fast energy loss. Uh, and yeah, you're right. Um, in it depends on circumstances. Sometimes uh, channels can be opened, right? I would not uh, show the experiments, but there are experiments with quantum point contact when they see nonlinear effects, when they see channel opening with uh, uh, bias voltage, voltage applied between the leads. Um, and uh, they, in experiment, eventually change the configuration with, with the gate voltage. It's much more convenient. Uh, why is it so? Is the gate voltage, if you, if you saw the scale, they can change it by electron volts, right? Uh, since there's no conduction between gate voltage and uh, anything, it was uh, uh, possible to consider electron trans, but not violating this uh, condition. All right, another question. Why are electrons quasi-particles around the Fermi energy? Good. It's a pretty much... Uh, bootstrap answer. You know what bootstrap is? Who knows what's a bootstrap? What is a bootstrap? Oh, it's a very fundamental concept. Let me talk about this as though I hardly have time. Um, bootstrap, um, American, uh, whatever, rangers, military, they have boots like this, which are laced, they are laces. And the bootstrap is ability to lift your body by pulling the laces, okay? If you've managed to do so, this ability is certainly present. So that many uh, physical questions usually related to high energy physics are, are solved by a bootstrap process. So uh, what is a bootstrap uh, for our systems? We do know that there are metals. We do know that there are metals. There are materials which are conducting. Uh, since they're conducting, there must be, in quantum terms, there must be some excitations which are very easy to create, cost less energy. Those are electrons near Fermi level. They're easy to move. So that's so that we come to the idea that uh, there must be some quasi-electrons. That's bootstrap. Um, another story why they don't interact between, uh, between each other. That depends on the metals. There are very kind of bad metals, which are very rare, very um, do not occur almost where electrons do interact even at family level. But most metals, one can show it by calculation, one can show it experimentally. In most metals, quasi-particles do not interact. The interaction is kind of proportional to the energy distance from family level. Does it answer your question, Sasha? Good. Uh, let us go counting. I have to do it pretty fast, but it's also um, a fast subject. Let us first understand how do we count. We have a set of discrete events and we measure it uh, just by counting with our fingers during certain time of measurement. And we repeat this measurement again and again. 
These events can be numbers of babies born, can be numbers of birds which pass your window, uh, and can be electrons passing in the structure. What is the result of this measurement? The result of the measurement is histogram. You have different counts and uh, different possible outputs of the measurement. And you just count how many times this outcome has happened. So you have probability for any n. Usually physicists do not measure such uh, probability, although they could, because it requires much time. It's pretty fast to estimate the average, and in our case, it will be average current. It's also possible to estimate the spread of the distribution. For us, it will be uh, current noise. But in principle, if one measures long enough under proper conditions, one can make the whole distribution. Fine. So statistics of electron transfer is described by such distribution. Uh, right. I'd rather talk about characteristic functions and probabilities. Um, if you took to probability course, you know what characteristic function is. If you don't know, let me have a kind of 30 second crash course. Characteristic function is a Fourier transform of probability distribution. It is applied to any probability distribution statistics. Uh, so it depends on a parameter of this Fourier transform. What is the use? of this uh, characteristic function, it factorizes for independent events. Probabilities of independent events, if you count them, they do not factorize, but characteristic functions does do. That's why the look of this um, characteristic function um, is proportional to time window. Why? Because uh, independent events are independent if uh, are separated by large times. And uh, they are correlated within some correlation time. And for large um, time window, T, the characteristic function look of this just uh, um, would sum up all these uh, independent events happen here, here, here. So it's proportional to, to time. Let us uh, see what would be the use of this quantity for birds. Suppose we set by uh, the window long enough to compute uh, probability of birds passing the window to compute the characteristic function and present its feed coefficients in this form. What would it give to us? There are some coefficients to determine it. And this is probability of single birds, not correlated with any other birds. That would be probability, you know, that birds sometimes come in pairs the probability is that they pass your window in pairs. And also probability to come in large flocks, right? Say so they differ by um, the form in which they enter a characteristic function. So that was very crash course. Sorry for that. Um, let me just, uh, sorry, I would take uh, several minutes of your time, but it doesn't make sense to stop here. Uh, let me show you Levitov formula, which is an extension of Landauer formula. It doesn't only give you average current, 
it gives you every detail of uh, counting statistics. So how does it look like? We find this log of characteristic function over here. And we sum up over many things. We sum up over spin, uh, over energy, over channels. Summing up means that these processes are independent. So electron transfers are independent in different energy strips. They're independent in different channels. And what would be good, very, what would be very logical and uh, fast assumption. I would say that electrons from the right and from the left are not dependent. Indeed, left is one infinity, right is one another infinity. And uh, by principle of locality, they cannot be correlated. They are. And I can see that here, transfers from the left and from the right is not a sum. It's a more complex function, which contains these blocking factors. Filling factors from the left and from the right. So how can I understand this? It's very simple. Electrons are fermions. So to have a transfer from the left to the right, first one should have some electrons on the left proportional to filling factor. But also one should have empty space on the right because electrons are fermions as they could not take the same state. That's why there was a blocking factor which goes in. That blocks transfers at negative energies. Indeed, at energies much um, smaller than chemical potential, uh, one sees electrons which would transfer on a structure in different direction. Okay, it's clear that average current is zero, but what could think of current noise? There's no noise. All transfers at negative energies are blocked due to the fact that electrons are permanent. Good, that is a complex formula and it was by the time they have computed this formula was kind of a job of quantum calculation. Very original, very difficult calculation which took uh, a year perhaps. And the authors perhaps have been disappointed by the fact that the result in simple case can be exp explained by to, to any street hooligan. Let me provide this explanation. This actual uh, formula for statistic function, here we find a number of attempts, we have studied this. And uh, it corresponds to a distribution which mathematically uh, looks perhaps not very comprehensive, but it's famous uh, Pascal, yeah, Pascal distribution, I believe, and it shows the following. This is the explanation for straight polygon. You know what? Electrons come into a structure form a very accurate cube. They come to the structure one by one and use it as a gambling machine. With a chance T, they pass through this gambling machine. And they're happy, they go forward. With a chance one minus T, they go back. And distribution of this process is precisely as the, as the statistics of electron transfer provided all electrons are going in one direction, which means that voltage difference is higher than temperature. Sorry for delaying you. Um, I will um, talk about types of transmissions uh, next time. Uh, now I uh, will... Uh, stop uh, 